नमस्कार वेरी गुड इवनिंग टू ऑल द व्यूवर्स इन दिस श्री दत्तोपंत ठेंगडी ऑनलाइन लेक्चर सीरीज दिस इज अ ट्वेल्थ लेक्चर एंड आई होप एंड आई बिलीव दैट ऑल द व्यूवर्स आर एंजॉइंग दिस एंटायर लेक्चर सीरीज एंड गेटिंग बेनिफिटेड आउट ऑफ इट टूडे वी हैव अ डिस्टिंग स्पीकर इमिनेंट लॉयर मिस्टर संग्राम देसाई Uh, who is also a bar council member i request advocate yashodeep deshmukh to introduce our uh, today's speaker thank you pravartak good evening viewers mr sangram desai is member of bar council of maharashtra and goa but he is a distinguished lawyer very well known in the districts of sindhudurg ratnagiri kolhapur having handled large number of session trials and also in the state of goa he has also appeared before the bombay high court in several matters and one of the famous matters was the nandos murder trial where initially out of the 10 suspects some 8 were convicted and he had his role as an advocate in that matter was appreciated by the honorable bombay high court he has been active in this circuit of delivering lectures even for the bar council conducted lectures and otherwise we are very thankful to you sir for having spared time today for accepting our invitation to share your knowledge which comes from actual practice of session matters in different courts of the state of maharashtra but before i conclude the introduction of our distinguished speaker i would also like to make an announcement of a novel event a game being conducted by the mumbai unit of the adhivakta parishad the name of the game is lossy viewers you can follow our facebook page for further details of this game it is basically a housey game meant for lawyers and that is why the name law c that is law housey it is a very fun filled game which gives you an opportunity for academic study and also have fun with the other lawyers who you cannot meet physically today so over to pravartak now thank you ah uh, thank you yashodeep i am aware that uh, all the viewers uh, would love to participate in this game uh, i believe uh, that you should and now i request uh, to our distinguished guest speaker uh, to deliver uh, uh, to deliver the lecture thank you pravatak uh, thank you very much uh, first of all i thank the organizers for giving me an opportunity to share my views on the subject given subject my friends uh, just before the, uh, i started the, we are starting this session i had a small talk with the organization organizers and i was told that the time limit for discussing this subject would be around 30 minutes to 45 minutes and my friends uh, considering the subject dying declaration uh, i don't feel this is quite adequate time to discuss the subject of dying declaration but still i feel that this subject we can divide into two parts the first part is the theoretical part of it and the second is the practical approach when we are conducting a trial how to use this section in either ways for the defense or the prosecution so therefore we have to divide this subject or this lecture into two parts one is a very theoretical part which is very important by the way sometimes we just go theoretically and we don't know how to practically apply it and sometimes we just go very practically saying that okay we have to just falsify a few witnesses and we are done but at that point of time we realize the importance of theoretical part of it so i'll try to touch both the sides of this uh dying declaration now my friends the this word dying declaration is nowhere defined in the indian evidence act you will never find a term called as dying declaration so therefore what is this dying declaration and where does it come from 
my friends we have to come or we have to go to the provisions of section 60 of the indian evidence act and section 60 of the indian evidence act clearly state that a witness who has seen heard or perceived anything has to step in the witness box and state whatever he has seen heard or perceived that is to say that by the provisions of section 60 the hearsay evidence is barred is ruled out and therefore we have to understand we always call upon the direct evidence of a witness in any criminal trial now there are only a very few provisions in which ogoba is given to this basic principle of or underlying under section 60 of the indian evidence act and that provision is my friends section 32 of the indian evidence act we are dealing here with the provision of section 32 of the indian evidence act and more so section 32 subsection 1 now when we say it's a dying declaration in common parlance we just understand as if a statement made by a person who is about to die this is what is understood in common parlance but in the eyes of law it has a different meaning of course it includes the statement made by a person when he is about to die but then the provisions of section 32 subsection 1 are relevant and very important so i'll directly start with the provisions of section 32 now this comes under chapter 2 of the indian evidence act as to the relevancy of facts and i'll just read out section 32 so that we understand now section 32 speaks about cases in which statement of a relevant fact by a person who is dead or cannot be found etc is relevant statements now kindly see the every word of the statement or the section it's very important statements written or verbal of a relevant facts made by a person who is dead or who cannot be found or who has become incapable of giving evidence or whose attendance cannot be procured without an amount of delay or expense which under the circumstances of the case appear to the court unreasonable are themselves relevant facts in the following cases so my friend we are dealing here with a provision what are the basic requ- requirements for the first part of this section we have to understand so firstly there has to be a statement made by a person who is dead of course when he was alive so this is a statement made by a person who is dead now what is this statement we are talking about this statement should be of a relevant fact so this is the second important fact we need to understand that it is not just a statement but a statement about a relevant fact now what is the third requirement as i said that the person must be dead now if these basic things are satisfied then the statements becomes relevant under section 32 the chapter of relevancy of facts now my friends the further provision sub section 1 we are dealing here with a person who is dead so therefore there are other sub sections 2 3 i mean till sub section 8 but we are dealing here only with sub section 1 and what it says when it relates to cause of death when the statement is made by a person as to the cause of his death now it is very important kindly see the constructions of the word when the statement is made by a person as to the cause of his death so the statement should relate to the cause of his own death and not that of any other person next or as to any of the circumstance of the transaction which resulted in his death now my friends this is very important normally we construe it as the statement made by a person 
as to the direct cause of his death. No. In this provision under section 32.1, not only the direct cause of death, but the words used are, you have to very carefully read these words, or as to any of the circumstances of the transaction which resulted in his death. So it's not a direct cause of death, but there may be circumstances, the transaction, which resulted in his death. And these circumstances of the transaction will also be relevant under the provisions of section 32.1. Further, in cases in which the cause of that person's death comes into question. So now this is again very important. It is not just any matter where section 32.1 can play a role. It is only in those cases, in those trials, I'll come to whether civil or criminal later on, in those cases where the death of that particular person is actually a fact in issue. And therefore, we have to understand that it is not just any, any case, any trial, but where the death, the, the cause of person's death comes into question. Now, my friends, in addition to this, there is a very important aspect of this provision. Now, this is this provision, even though originally it comes from the English law, in this part of the provision of section 32.1, it differs from the English law. And we have to understand that such statements are relevant whether the person who made them was or not at the time when they were made under the expectation of death. So I pause here. So we have to understand. So we just call it as dying declaration and therefore we assume that this statement must have been made by that person when he was under impression or apprehension that he's going to die. So under the apprehension that I'm going to die, a person makes a statement. So it is not only related to those circumstances, but the provisions of section 32.1 makes it very clear that such statements are relevant whether the person who made them was or not at the time when they were made under the expectation of death. So it is not a must, it is not a necessity that such person must be under the expectation of death. Now let's come to the later part of it. And whatever may be the nature of the proceeding in which the cause of death comes into question. Now therefore I said these two things are very important and that is the basic difference between the Indian law and the English law. The difference between the provisions of section 32 one of the Indian Evidence Act and that of the English law. Even though originally it comes from there, two basic differences are this. Number one, under the English law, the statement has to be made by a person who is apprehending his death. So therefore, the first requirement under the English law is that, that the person who has made the statement is under the apprehension that he's going to die for whatever reasons. And he has a full knowledge, therefore I use the word apprehension. So he's going to die and he's having a full knowledge that he's going to die. This is number one. Number two, under the English law, the evidence can be given only in cases of homicidal deaths. Now my friends, as, so, as far as Indian law is concerned, or as far as section 32, one of the Indian Evidence Act is concerned, it need not be a criminal trial, much less a homicidal death. It can be a suicidal death. It can be an accidental death. It can be a civil suit for damages caused on account of a death of a person. So therefore, the scope of Section 32.1 compared to the scope of the English law is quite larger and therefore so many things are included but the basic thing which is included here is that the person making a statement need not be under the apprehension of death now the reason why i'm saying this is because it is always presumed 
that the person who is on the deathbed or who is going to die will not make a false statement and therefore under the, this basic assumption that the person will not meet his maker which lies in his mouth this is a basic principle which we are talking about under this basic assumption that he is not going to lie because he is going to die this provision was based on under the english law but under the provisions of section 321 we have slightly enlarged the scope of giving the evidence now here a particular statement made by a person even though at that point of time when he made the statement was absolutely not under the apprehension of death and after some point of at after some point of time he dies he passes away then even though those statements will be relevant and admissible under section 321 for example like in case of dowry deaths a wife is talking a wife has uh, committed suicide her husband is facing trial for office is offense under section 306 and during her lifetime there is no time limit as such during her lifetime she is talking she is speaking to a mother to a sister and she is explaining to them what she is facing at home the assaults the assaults or any any sort of cruelty that was made to her that finally drove her to commit suicide so therefore here such statements also become relevant if they are directly connected to the death of that person now my friends there is one more aspect which we need to consider that under the provisions of section 321 what should be in question it is the death of that person which should be the subject matter of that particular trial of or the subject matter before the court or the issue before the court now let's for example say that it is a person a witnesses a incident of murder of person b so this is very important witness or or a, a person a witnesses a murder of person b now therefore b has already died the police come and record the statement of a who is a witness to that incident the statement is recorded and thereafter because of some ailment or in accident this person a dies or passes away now the question is the statement of witness a is very important in so far as the murder of person b is concerned because he is a eyewitness and his statement has already been recorded by police or may be even the magistrate the question is whether that statement becomes relevant under the provisions of section 32 one this is irrelevant statement because the statement was made by that person in regards to death of some other person and not the death of person a and therefore we have to fully understand this fact that this statement where the fact of the person who is deposing whose dying declaration is recorded if that is the fact or is the issue before the court then it will be relevant under section 32 of the indian evidence act now my friends these are the basic uh, uh, ideas of the provisions of or the ingredients of section 32 of the indian evidence act now the question is there are so many other aspects now whether a, who can record a statement under section 32 and it what form and what are the different forms of dying declaration this is a very normal question which might be asked so there are a few ways and how a dying declaration is made now the words incorporated under the provisions of section 32 are statements written or verbal now my friends kindly understand the words are written written is very clear and 
written or verbal so you have to understand this very important aspect what verbal includes we have to understand that number 1 a statement made by oral statement by made by a person who is about to die is heard by some third person so it's a oral dying declaration number 1 number 2 a statement not orally for whatever reasons that person is not able to speak his throat is slit he has some other problems he can't speak so by signs he makes a particular statement let us for example say two or three persons are before him and somebody asks him a question or the magistrate asks him a question who committed this offense and he points towards a particular person so it's a sign by sign also pointing towards somebody he can make that statement so one is a oral statement one he can maybe by signs or any other mode make a statement the third important statement is written like before a person before his death a person make writes a suicide note or as i was giving an example of a wife who committed suicide she might be father mother sister anybody or a close friends so all these written statements which which show the cause of a death are all relevant under section 32 of the indian evidence act so it's oral it's written it's by sign now the fourth mode according to me is narration now it is as good as making a oral statement but a oral statement which has been written down which we normally these days call as a dying declarations which is recorded by a magistrate or sometimes by a police so what happens in the circumstances if a person is admitted to a hospital the police go there they inquire with him and if he is in a fit condition they call the concerned magistrate to record the statement of that person now here a magistrate comes and the witness narrates or maybe the magistrate asks him some questions and that is recorded so it's a oral narration of the facts and being written down by a second person or a scribe and thereafter if he is in a condition to sign it he signs it or puts a thumb impression or maybe nothing of it so therefore according to me these are the four ways oral then written by signs and by narration that is a oral statement which is written down so these are the four ways in which a dying declaration can be recorded now then the question is whether any specific person has a authority to record a dying declaration now you will find a catena of judgments different aspects of the dying declaration and you will understand one important thing that there is no such rule or authority as such by which only particular a particular person can record a dying declaration now in the given circumstances it may so happen that a person is seriously injured he has been taken to the hospital there is no time for calling the police or maybe the magistrate who is the right person who whose evidence is always uh, given it uh, import or weightage or importance there is no time for that in those circumstances anybody can record a statement so just a common man maybe in the given circumstances the value evidentiary value of that with uh, dying declaration is a different thing but still any person can record a dying declaration even a police officer can record a dying declaration a doctor can record a dying declaration because he is the person who is in fact there treating that particular person in the given circumstances and lastly the most important he is on the highest pedestal that is a magistrate who records the statement and the reason why i am saying that he is on a higher pedestal is because he has no axe to grind against the accused and therefore it is assumed or let's say presumed that he will be recording the statement of the that particular person in a unbiased manner and the true version of what he is stating so therefore what i feel is from the judgments what we will gather is that anybody can record a statement 
now in in every case has its own facts so i I'll, i'll come to that later on this is the first part of it now the question is how a dying declaration is recorded now my friends there is no performa there is no particular procedure given as to in what format a particular dying declaration can be recorded we have to understand here it's it's a simple logic it's a matter of common sense by by what we say recording a dying declaration we are just recording a statement of a person who is about to die therefore in there is no particular format of recording a dying declaration but there are certain safeguards which we need to understand and those safeguards are first of all if it is recorded by a magistrate then it is expected that the dying declaration should be recorded in question and answer form so a magistrate may visit a person in a hospital or wherever he is and he may ask question if there are injuries how are these injuries uh, how were these injuries caused who is the person what, or in what circumstances these injuries were caused to you all sorts of questions will be asked but it is preferred that the dying declaration should have a detailed recording of the questions which were asked to that person and the answers which were given by the person the reason why i'm saying this is because a magistrate may ask a question in a particular context and maybe the person who is a deponent who is not in a fit state of mind may answer that question in a different context and therefore in under, in order to understand in what context that particular statement was made or the answer was given it should be recorded in a question and answer form it is again not a must it is not a rule it is a matter of prudence it is a rule of prudence that it should be recorded in a question and answer form now the next important aspect which we have to understand my friends is that it is not only the question and answer form but the exact words used by the deceased or the deponent so why i am saying this is because many a times the deponent they come from a particular background a, a, a witness who is from a rural background will have his own way of expressing things or telling things the words used the sentences he makes the way he speaks so they have their own ways of it and in order that the court gets the exact picture of what or exact uh, uh, understanding of what he was trying to say the words used by the deponent should be as far as practically possible be recorded in his own words now my friend sometimes it so happens that there is a magistrate who doesn't understand marathi or uh, he understands marathi but he is not able to write marathi so he goes there he asks a question to the particular witness or the deponent he speaks in marathi but as he is not able to write in marathi the, he scribes it in english or hindi now this translation from marathi to english or hindi is the act of the person who is recording that is the magistrate so therefore in these circumstances when it is not recorded in the actual words of the deponent in these circumstances after the statement is recorded it should be expl- read and explained it over to the deponent in his own language and understanding and after he says that yes whatever you written is right after its accuracy is confirmed only then it should be or it should be signed so this is the second aspect which we have to see in case of a dying declaration recorded by a magistrate of course there has to be definitely he has to sign the deposition or the statement but there are circumstances where let's say a person is uh, uh, set ablaze and there are bird injuries on his body or most probably his hands is not able to sign in those circumstances even with the the magistrate need not take the signatures or even the thumb impression so it depends upon the facts and circumstances of each case whether it has to be signed whether a thumb impression uh, has to be obtained or whether without signing or even obtaining the thumb impression 
that particular piece of evidence can be held to be admissible or a good evidence so this is a different aspect now there is one more important aspect which we have to understand the mental condition of the person who is deposing or is making a statement is one very important aspect and my friends you must have come across so many session trials cases wherein we challenge we attack as defense lawyers we attack on one important aspect that the deponent was not in a fit condition to depose he had no absolute uh, consciousness or understanding as to what he was saying maybe because he was under the influence of some medicines or maybe he was badly injured and therefore the fitness the conditions in which the mental condition in which the deponent uh, had made the statement is very very important aspect and therefore normally it is expected that the prosecution should lead evidence to show that the person who had made the statement was in a fit mental state and understanding the questions and understanding what answers he has given so this is another requirement of dying declaration if it is to be proved in the court of law now this is all about written dying declarations what about oral dying declarations my friends it so happens sometimes a uh, a uh, person who is about to die there is no time for calling a magistrate for calling police or anybody and therefore in those circumstances even a oral statement made by that particular deponent or the person who is going to die that these are the circumstances which led to this injuries the statement oral statement made by that person to another person he need not be any particular class of person he could be a friend he could be a relative he could be a doctor he could be a attendant he could be anybody a police or a magistrate anybody so therefore a oral statement made by a person who thereafter dies as to the cause of death is again relevant now what is expected in this oral dying declaration so here is a witness who will come and say that this witness stated this is what has happened and that is what precisely i was talking about that this is an exception to the rule of hearsay evidence so he is just going to come and step it in a witness box and say i met this person at this point of time in the hospital or wherever he was in this particular condition and he told me that he was stabbed by for a person or person b whatever that person is and in this particular manner now this evidence becomes relevant but what is more important is now this person will not be able to recollect the exact words so here the rule of prudence and the rule of caution is important because it depends upon the intellectual understanding or the intellectual level of the person to whom that statement is made so here lies the crux of the matter he might have said something in one perspective and the person who listened to it understood it in a different perspective and therefore in case of oral dying declaration i feel there has to be certain amount of corroboration to the statement of that particular witness in case of written statement maybe it's, it's not required to that extent now what about the written dying declaration now my friends as i said these might be letters or a suicide note now these documents will have to be proved in a particular way like if it's a letter then it has to be produced in the court the handwriting of in that particular letter it will have to be proved by proper maybe scientific evidence and identification of the person known to that person who has written the letter or a suicide note in these circumstances the signature of that person and the authenticity of that document will have to be proved so these are the basic broader ways in which a dying declaration can be proved now my friends there is one important aspect which we have to understand that evidence can be laid in a particular way it's fine oral statement written statement everything is fine but what is the evidentiary value of a dying declaration and this is a very important question now uh, 
I, I may be short of time, therefore I'm trying to cut short. But the fact is, the evidentiary value of we will go come across a catena of judgments, they will be de dealing with different factual matrix of that particular case. And on the basis of the factual matrix of a particular case, the those appeals of the cases will be decided. But the evidentiary value of any dying declaration will definitely depend upon the facts and circumstances of each and every case. Now, there is one important judgment, which I would normally, I would, I, I normally never refer to the case laws because I feel that it's, it's, uh, it's a thing which you should do on your own and find out only then it helps you. But for explaining the basic principles of the evidentiary value, of a dying declaration, I will refer to three judgments and then uh, I'll sum up. The basic requirement for the proving the dying declaration, a very important case, my friends, you'll have to, and this is Kushal Rao versus State of Bombay, 1957, lawsuits, Supreme Court, 93. This, I think, is the, if you see any of the judgment on the point of dying declaration, you will always find the basic principles embodied in this judgment will always be reproduced in almost all the judgments. And the basic principles or the conclusions drawn in this judgment are very important. It's a very short paragraph. Six points are discussed for the conclusion drawn in so far as the dying declaration is concerned. Now it says in paragraph number 16 of the said judgment, it has been very clearly stated that it cannot be laid down as an absolute rule of law that a dying declaration cannot form the sole basis of conviction unless it is corroborated. So what is the first thing? That dying declaration can be a sole basis of conviction and corroboration is not required. There are certain safeguards which you need to have before relying on the dying declaration. But uh, there is no rule of law which says that you cannot base a conviction solely on a dying declaration. And that's the first principle. Now, the second, that each case must be determined on its own facts, keeping in view the circumstances in which the dying declaration was made. So as I, as I was saying, it is depending upon the factual matrix of the case. For example, let's say, if the prosecution is not able to prove that the person was in a fit state of mind, obviously, we are not going to rely. And this is a peculiar fact of a peculiar case. And therefore, there cannot be a straight jacket formula for believing or not believing a dying declaration. Now, the third important aspect <clears throat> that it cannot be laid down as a general proposition that a dying declaration is a weaker kind of evidence than other pieces of evidence. Now, this is again very important. We come across different pieces of different kinds of evidence. So, it is said that dying declaration was made, it's kind of basically a hearsay evidence. So, we should treat it like hearsay evidence. No. It says that it will be treated like any other kind of evidence. So it will be at par with a oral testimony of a witness. The fourth important aspect, that a dying declaration stands on the same footing, um, same footing as another piece of evidence and has to be judged in the light of surrounding circumstances and with reference to the principles governing, governing the weighing of evidence. This is what I was discussing. Number five, that a dying declaration which has been recorded by a competent magistrate, this is very important, a dying declaration which has been recorded by a competent magistrate in the proper manner, that is to say, in the form of questions and answers <clears throat> and far as practicable in the words of the maker of the declaration stands on much higher footing than a dying declaration which depends upon oral testimony which may suffer from all the infirmities of human memory and human character. So this is what I was discussing. 
so if it is recorded by a magistrate in a particular way then it bec- it has a great importance because there is some sort of guarantee or assurance that there was a person who was not biased toward i towards either of the accused or the complainant or the deponent and he has just recorded the statement as stated by by that particular person and therefore a great weight has been attached to such statements the next that in order to test the reliability of a dying declaration the court has to keep in view the circumstances like the opportunity of dying man for observation for example whether there was a sufficient light in if the crime was committed at night whether the capacity of the man to remember the facts stated has not been impaired at the time he was making the statement by circumstances beyond his control that the statement has been consistent throughout if he had several opportunities of making a dying declaration apart from the official record of it and the statement has been made at the earliest opportunity and was not the result of tutoring by interested parties now my friends the last point point number 6 of this judgment will open up a pandora's box for the defense lawyers now how many things have been mentioned i mean it's again a matter of common sense when you are dealing with a dying declaration what is the defense to be taken in what way you are going to deal with the dying declaration all these facts depends upon the circumstances of those particular cases but then what is the important fact that you will have to understand just because a witness comes in a witness box and proves that the dying person has stated this to me and that does not mean that a case is proved my friends you have to understand this fact that by doing this they might prove only one aspect that the dying person had made this statement to this particular person but whether that was true or false will always be challenged by the defense and the prosecution will always be in a duty bound to prove by other circumstances and evidence that the statement is a true version of what had, what has happened and therefore it will not be accepted as the gospel truth in the given circumstances and therefore if you are able to prove let's let's for example there are two three ways in which you can do it for example if a deponent or a person who dies later on makes a statement that a particular incident has happened in a particular way but by other witnesses you can bring it on record that the incident has not happened in the manner and mode in which the deponent has stated in his dying declaration obviously if there is a contrary evidence then there will be two sets of evidence on one important aspect and therefore there will be a contradictory evidence on one important aspect and therefore in these circumstances it will be disbelieved or let's for example say that a deponent makes a statement a full statement and first part of the statement he comes up with a particular case and in the last part of the statement he makes a contrary statement so basically there is a inherent infirmity in the dying declaration itself so even though if it is proved by the prosecution witnesses even by the magistrate when there are basic inherent infirmities in the case in the dying declaration then it will absolutely not help the case of prosecution now my friends there is as i was saying there are so many other ways in which you can basically prove now let's say if it's a oral dying declaration now if you are able to prove that the person to whom that particular statement was made was interested witness not just a interested witness but is a habitual liar or from his cross examination you point out to the court or you prove uh, to the court that this particular has lied on a very important and a vital aspect then the testimony of the person to whom this dying declaration was made will not be accepted and thereby the dying declaration will not be the basis of conviction you will always have a chance of acquittal 
Likewise, there are so many other defenses. You can always cross-examine a medical officer and point out that the particular person was not in a fit state of mind to make a statement. Or nowadays, it so happens that when a witness is admitted, oh, sorry, uh, a person or a person who has been assaulted is admitted to a hospital, the first thing that happens is the medical officer asks questions to him. What has happened to you? It's, you normally find it in any medis, medical certificate. So that person gives a reason or explanation for his injuries. So that is the first statement made by that person when he's immediately brought to the hospital or even before that. So when he was, when he's been brought to the hospital from the place of incident to the hospital, he might be in the ambulance, make a statement to a relative of his. So I have come across so many cases where a person makes a statement when he was brought from the spot of incident to the hospital. Thereafter, the doctor inquires with him to find out the history of the case and he makes a second statement. Thereafter, the police come, they inquire with him, they record his statement, this is the third statement, and thereafter, if the time permits, circumstances permits, a magistrate is called and the magistrate records the statement. Not only that, but the magistrate may record not one statement, but maybe two or maybe three statements. So in these circumstances, you will find more than one statement, dying declarations of a person. Now, here in these circumstances, if you are able to point out the contradictions, not the omissions, or even the omissions of the contradictions, or different versions of the same incident given in these different dying declarations, then you still may be able to convince the court that this is not a reliable piece of evidence. Now, my friends, I'll, I'll just conclude this session with one important case. The reason why I keep on saying that there is, not, there is no straitjacket uh, formula for deciding the evidentiary value of a particular dying declaration is, I'll give a classic example. Now, I'm referring to a very famous case, Sharab Sarda versus State of Maharashtra. This is 1984 lawsuits, Supreme Court 176. Now, I take, uh, if I start reading, I'll take some time. But this is a very important judgment insofar as dying declaration is concerned. And more so, one dying declaration in how many ways it, it can be interpreted or the scope, more specifically, the scope of Section 32.1 of the Indian Evidence Act. What comes within the ambit of Section 32.1, three judges have decided this, the, it, this is a decision of full bench of the Honorable Supreme Court. And it was presided over by Honorable S. Murtaza Fazil Ali, A. Vardarajan, and Honorable Sri Mukherjee. These were the three judges. Now, it will be interesting. I don't have time to read it. But the scope of Section 32.1 is discussed in this particular judgment. The, the, all the three judges have conquered on one aspect that this is a case of acquittal and they have acquitted. But insofar as the scope of Section 32.1 is concerned, the first Honorable Judge Justice Murtaza Fazal Ali has observed that the letters written by the deceased to her sister, to her friend, and the statements made by the deceased, she, she was a wife who committed suicide, and before she died, she had written certain letters to her friends and relatives, and she had spoken over four in person to her relatives about the harassment that was meted out to her when she was with her husband. So the Honorable Supreme Court was considering the scope of Section 32.1. And Justice Fazil Ali observed that these statements, oral as well as written, that those are the letters and the oral statement made to her sister and her relatives are admissible under the provisions of Section 32.1. And more specifically, that is precisely what I was trying to point out. The reference was, or the uh, the reference was given to this statement, 
but the statement is made by a person as to the cause of a death or as to any of the circumstances of the transaction which resulted in the death in case in which the cause of person's death comes into question so the circumstances of the transaction which resulted in the death this was brought into action and therefore it was held by justice ali that these statements are admissible under section 321 now my friends you will also find that in the very same judgment justice varadarajan has absolutely disagreed with justice ali and has observed that the statements made by the person to the relatives and the letters do not fall within the scope or the ambit of section 321 because according to him they do not fall within the transaction the circumstances of the transaction which resulted in her death and then there is a third judge justice mukherjee who has observed that i agree with the observations of my brother judge justice ali but that there is no straight jacket formula those will have to be accepted in the given case in the particular circumstances they can be accepted and they cannot be accepted so this is one judgment wherein the full bench of the supreme court three judges came to three different conclusions in so far as one set of evidence is concerned and therefore my friends there will be always conflicting judgments you will find so it is all depending upon the facts and circumstances of a particular case that you will have to prepare a defense or the prosecutor has to lead evidence in a particular way and therefore you will not find any particular straight jacket formula actually i wanted to rely on one more judgment but i won't just read it out i'll just give you the citation maybe maybe because you will find it out there are 11 important observations in this judgment this is 2007 all mr criminal page 847 this is a judgment by the honorable supreme court justice arjit pasayat and justice ravindran mohan lal and others versus state of haryana mohan lal and others versus state of haryana 2007 all mr criminal page 847 i'll not read the observations in, in this judgment but they have pointed out 11 important circumstances to believe or disbelieve or the evidentiary value of a dying declaration and for their every observation they have cited a particular case why they are relying on these particular circumstances so maybe this judgment will come to your help and therefore while concluding as i was pointing out that uh, there will be always you will get different uh, new facets new aspects when different facts and the factual matrix of a case come before you you will have to deal with that particular case in that particular way and therefore i always feel that you should have a theoretical knowledge of a particular provision of law but the most important aspect is to practically apply the theoretical knowledge to the facts and circumstances of a particular case and therefore i feel that i have covered almost uh, whatever i could in the given time and uh, therefore i thank all the organizers for giving me an opportunity and uh, most important a very good friend of mine advocate parijat pande who is uh, also instrumental in asking me to come over for this series of lecture thank you very much before before i conclude uh an announcement was made just before we started about the new game which is like housey and i feel all of you should participate because even when they were explaining this uh, new game to me it is about the different kinds of judgments and on which subject these judgments deal with or which subjects are these uh, judgments on so it will be like a quiz and by playing this game maybe not maybe of course definitely we will again go through all these judgments and the basic principles laid down in these judgments so therefore i request all of you 
that you also should participate in laws i i hope that's the same thing and uh, i thank you all again for hearing me patiently and i thank the organizers also thank you very much thank you thank you so much sir that was quite enlightening experience uh, sir we have a few questions so we are running uh, out of time but still since there are questions uh, i request you can we deal with it yeah yeah definitely you can yeah. uh, so the first question is by advocate chandrakant sawan sir uh, he asked in a dowry death of of a dying declare uh, in a dowry death if dying declaration is made by deceased after relatives discussion with deceased what is the evid evidentiary value of it so as i was telling you the six Uh, uh observation of the judgment which i cited it says that if there is a chance wherein a witness is tutored just because they were present doesn't make it uh unbelievable or something like that but if there is a chance that the witness relatives or the witnesses are there and they tutor that particular witness and you can bring it out through cross examination or other circumstances that the witness the dying the deponent was tutored to tell particular thing and it is not the truth definitely it will have a lot of bearing on that and it might help the defense that to show that this is not the truthful version of what actually happened yes so the next question is whether endorsement of doctor is necessary at the beginning as well as at the end of dying declaration but the certifying oh, I, doctor I your first part i missed your first part i couldn't listen to you uh, so you the question is question? yes whether endorsement of doctor is necessary at the uh, beginning as well as at the end of dying declaration whether okay, well, certifying, whether yeah. certifying doctor should depose in witness box that stated by deceased before him okay so uh, there are two question, parts of the, this question the first part whether there has to be an endorsement yes if the witness is admitted in hospital and examined by a particular doctor and is making a statement it is always advisable that the doctors makes a, a endorsement maybe not at the starting and the end but he makes a endorsement that the person was in a fit condition to give the statement sometimes it so happens that while the witness starts deposing initially he is in a fit state of mind but during the course of recording of that deposition he might not be in a fit state of mind and therefore it's advisable that there can there has to be endorsement at the starting and the end but again it is a rule of prudence it is not mandatory at all the doctor may just come and say that yes he was in a fit state of mind that state now the second part of the question as i understand is that whether the doctor should be examined now again this is again a rule of prudence you will find judgments wherein it has been held that even though the doctor gives a certificate that he was not in a fit state of mind but there are eye witnesses who say or there are sorry there are witnesses who say that the deponent made a statement to me and when the statement was made he was in a fit condition the court has gone to extend to believe those witnesses to whom the statement was made and not the doctor so therefore you will have to make all the efforts to show that from the doctors you positively bring out that this person was not in a fit state of mind to depose as stated in the dying declaration uh, so the next question is uh, by advocate amul joshi whether fir can be considered as a dying declaration if informant dies yes definitely fir can be considered as a dying declaration if the deponent dies it is obviously a statement which will be considered as a, of course now there are two things we are assuming and presuming that the statement which has been made is of course if it's an fir it will be definitely uh, mentioning about that particular incident though at that point of time he was not knowing that he is going to die but definitely it will be considered as a dying declaration yes uh, so the last question by advocate gyanchan maurya of uh, whether mobile video recording of a dying person by the person other than magistrate just after the incident is valid evidence or not and what required to be proved okay now this is a very good question now i think uh, sorry can i say yeah okay as per the information technology act now the electronic record is defined 
as a document now it's as good as a document right so therefore this is a very interesting thing now his oral statement has been recorded but it will be proved like a document that electronic record of that particular oral statement or whatever he said if it has been videographed or audio uh, clipping is there it will be proved in the court as per the provisions of indian evidence act and the information technology act as amended by the information technology act and obviously they will be relevant because of course then again that statement has to be made in which the cause of his death or any circumstances of transaction relating to the cause of his death will have to be mentioned in that video or the audio recording then definitely it will be admissible and it will be held as a very good evidence but the defense always will have a chance in cross examination to show that it was manipulated but yes it can be held as a good piece of evidence thank you thank you so much sir now i request uh, advocate saloni bhule uh, for word of thanks and uh, she will also explain uh, the uh, idea behind this law of the game i request advocate saloni bhule please hello thank you so much sir thank you so much for the insightful session and explaining the legal concepts of dying declaration and also apprehension of death A special thanks to the social media platforms for making this gathering possible also the internet connection and last but not the least the viewers you really keep us going so keep on watching keep on viewing and now coming down to uh, because of your encouragement and because of the social media platforms even during these times when we are under lockdown we have curated at akhil bharti adivakta parishad mumbai unit has curated a game for you where we meet up our legal fraternity meets up and has a chance of interacting and having a fun filled academic exchange so a game called lozi legal house so how does that work we give you a list of 90 case laws from the list of 90 case laws you select any 20 and from that 20 you prepare your list your table and upload it in the google forms that we are circulating uh, of the web all the resource material is available on our, our official pages do check that out so the registrations are open till 24th of may at 11 pm and the main game will be held on 26th of may at 4 pm do participate more the merrier and like i have been saying in the tutorials let's socialize during this physical distancing thank you so much ah uh, thank you so much sir uh, it was really a wonderful experience and uh, now i request uh, all the viewers to kindly follow our facebook page our uh, youtube channel kindly share like and subscribe thank you all Thank you so much. Thank you.